All right, and now I'm going to um, touch on just a couple of things. So I'll introduce myself first. For those who don't know me, I'm Connie Kohlmeyer. I'm an educator with the Conservation Foundation. And we would like to thank Itasca Bank and Trust and Bedrock Earthscapes for sponsoring this webinar this evening. Sponsors like these help us to keep these webinars free for everyone. And um, please, if you would like to sponsor, contact us for more information. And I will be posting links in the chat um, where you can sponsor, you can contact us through email, you can, um, I'll post some things on for our website. You'll have all the information in the chat and I'll post information about our sponsors as well, the links to their website. So um, you can also help us aside from sponsorship, you can help us keep the webinars free. Um, we will be posting additional links for things that you might be interested in like our native plant guide, rain barrel information and much more. And along with that, we'll have a link to donate or become a member if you're interested. So if you do enjoy these webinars, I encourage you to please donate to help TCF continue to do all the wonderful things we do, including and in addition to our webinars. And when you become a member, you'll also enjoy a wide variety of members only offerings. And 2022 is our 50th anniversary at the Conservation Foundation. So we've got some fun events and different things in the works. You can follow us on social media and learn more and stay updated on our events and happenings. I do have a couple of events and happenings to announce quickly. Our upcoming webinar next month is going to be Wednesday evening, June 1st, 7 p.m. And the topic is local foods from the farm and from your yard. So we'll learn a bit about the importance of local foods and how they help our environment, where we can source them. And we'll even learn some vegetables and herbs that you can grow on your own all the way into the fall. We, uh, speaking of vegetables and herbs, the Conservation Foundation's Green Earth Harvest Organic Vegetable and Herb Seedling Sale opens online tomorrow for members and farm shareholders. And then it opens the next day for the general public. So we've got ordering online and plant pickups are scheduled for May 13th and 14th at McDonald Farm. And a lot of these plants do sell quickly. So you might wanna check that out. And then we also, for some of our upcoming um, events that you can register for. We have Nature on the Farm summer camps for kids happening all summer long and family adventures that the whole family can attend. So make sure you check those out. So if you do go on the website, just peruse and we've got all kinds of fun things happening on the farm all the time. So we'd love to have you come out and visit us. With that and all of our announcements though, I don't wanna take up too much time because I wanna, I wanna get to Julie. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over. I'd like to introduce to you, Julie Janoski with the Morton Arboretum Plant Clinic. And I'm going to turn off my camera and let Julie take it away. And I'll watch for questions that we can get to um, pretty soon at the end. Then. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. I appreciate the Conservation Foundation inviting me to speak. That's um, really cool. I, I enjoy doing this. Um, and I always um, especially enjoy preaching to the choir, people who are really inter into horticulture and conservation. So um, our program tonight talks about common tree care misconceptions. And I think that um, we all have these ideas in our head of how we should take care of our trees. Um, but some of them we learned from grandmothers or from our neighbors or from YouTube videos that maybe didn't come from reputable resources or something like that. And so what we hope to do um, is clear up some of these tree care misconceptions that continue to endure. Um, my name is Julie Janoski, as Connie said, I'm with the Plant Clinic at the Morton Arboretum. And the first question I get asked um, in every one of these presentations that I give is, what the heck is a plant clinic? Um, a plant clinic is a free service provided by the Morton Arboretum in Lyle, Illinois. Um, we provide unbiased science-based answers to all types of plant questions um, for both home gardeners and green professionals. Um, Essentially, our mission is to take the latest best practices plant care and to communicate it to the public. To give you an idea of the scope, last year we answered over 18,000 questions from about 9,400 people in 48 states and 12 countries. Um, we do this through a couple of methods. Um, you can walk in, you can call us, you can email us, and I'll put that contact information up at the end of the program. Um, we are one of the few plant information services that answers the phone these days with a live, yes, a live person. Um, and we do respond to emails within about two business days, um, unless it's high season, April or May, and then sometimes it takes us three. 
Um, plant Clinic is part of the larger plant healthcare program at the Arboretum, which collects information from our, information from our grounds and from communities and clients with whom we interact so that we can see the trends um, about what's going on in plant care and translate that for, again, for the public. Um, plant Clinic can help with nearly any type of question that you might have about your plants, including best practices care, pest and disease diagnosis, treatment recommendations, plant selections. Um, we don't have a lab. Um, but we can do visual um, identification of pests and diseases for the most part. Um, although the Arboretum focuses on trees, Plant Clinic can answer questions about any type of plant. Um, we get a lot of house plant questions in the wintertime. Um, right now we're getting a lot of turf grass questions um, and we are happy to answer those as well as um, those for trees and shrubs. Um, so in 2021, just to give you an idea in terms of home gardeners, um, we answered, these were the, our sort of our top 10 questions that we got asked. Um, people wanted to know how to water properly, um, how to do plant ID or how to identify what they have in their yards, um, what kind of plant characteristics, pruning. Um, you know, so our big winners last year were drought, um, up 137%. There's no surprise there. Um, we had a 13 week drought here in Northern Illinois. Um, house plants are, were up 25% last year. Mulching was up 30%. Um, so there's a couple of things that, that we've really seen climbing the, the favorite questions categories. A um, couple of my personal favorites from last year were things like, um, hi, I have scale on my mango trees. How would I treat those? Oh, you're not from around here, are you? <laughs> so as it turns out, the gentleman was from Nigeria and we had to refer him to a local resource. We could not help him. Um, and then, you know, another one of my favorite ones last year was um, my plants are dying from the drought. What should I do? Water, water would be good. Uh, so we get some crazy questions and they're a lot of fun. Um, so how do we answer 19,000 questions a year? We've got an array of resources. Um, there are two full-time horticulturists, myself um, and Sharon Yisley, who's our plant knowledge specialist. And between the two of us, we have about 50 years of horticultural experience. In addition, um, Plant Clinic has more than 60 trained volunteers who help us answer the phone, email, and assist walk-in clients. Um, these volunteers come in with some sort of horticultural background. They have a degree. Um, they are master gardeners, something like that, um, but they have to be interviewed. And before we even let them pick up the phone, they have to go through 32 hours of training, um, of our training. So many have worked in the industry, others have hoarder biology degrees, but these people are the lifeblood of the plant clinic and they are how we can do what we do. Um, we also manage about 750 pages of content on the Morton Arboretum's website. Um, including all of the plant care topics, pest and disease information, and about 650 plant pages describing specific plant species in their care. Um, last year, for instance, uh, those pages garnered about 3 million page views. Um, we had a new website that launched last year that now includes a lot more information on our pages about plants, including um, picture carousels. So we have pictures of leaves and stems and bark and fruit and flowers. So if you're trying to identify something and you're getting close, um, you can go to our webpage and, and it would give you pictures of all of those things so that you can figure it out. Um, we also have a plant search on the website if you need ideas for which plants would grow successfully in, in um, certain situations. So you would go to plant and protect, search trees and plants, and more filters to find that plant search. One other resource that we offer is the Plant Healthcare Report. Um, this is a bi-weekly newsletter during the spring and summer and into the fall that discusses pests and disease issues that are occurring right now um, in a really condensed, easy to understand format. Um, we also post current statistics like soil temperatures, growing degree days, rainfall, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
at the Morton Arboretum Plant Clinic, what we're determining is with all of our crazy weather, we can't really rely on the calendar to know what we should be doing in our gardens or for our trees right now. And so we need to depend on these um, statistics um, about heat and soil temperatures and rainfall um, in order to know what to do when. Um, if you're interested in this, I'm gonna provide you with an email address at the end of this where you can go and sign up for our email blast or you can download them from our website um, as they come up. We post a full report every other week um, and then we post a statistics report on the off weeks. Um, in addition to you know, strictly plant clinic resources, we also have access to 100 years of Arboretum research. Um, our current research at the Arboretum includes efforts to protect endangered tree species worldwide, looking at what's happening to our trees in a changing climate, what tree species might be appropriate for the future, best management practices for biological controls of pests, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. You get the idea. Um, so we really are trying hard to do a lot of this research, and we're really trying to do a lot of applied research so that we can take what we're learning and translate that into best practices for people to use. So that's the plant clinic. Um, we're happy to serve you um, anytime you would like to phone or email us. All right, so let's get into the real program. Um, and I'm going to kind of go through some of the, the misconceptions that we have um, about tree care. Um, it's focused mostly on Northern Illinois. I heard there was somebody from Ohio. So you're gonna wanna look at your own soils and those kinds of things as you go through. Um, but uh, a lot of these things will apply across um, most of the temperate forest region. All right, so the first misconception here in Northern Illinois, we've got a ton of clay soil um, and Gardeners who find it difficult to dig in and who find it compacts too easily and all of those things um, think that clay soil is really bad. But the truth is, it's not all bad. It does drain poorly. Very often it holds way too much water, so we get a lot of root rot problems. Um, and it can affect a gardener's ability to dig holes and plant. Um, but, um, we can amend the clay with organic matter to improve this aspect of the soil. The other thing about clay soil is that it's actually really fertile. Um, it holds a lot of nutrients. And so while we may think that it's, it's bad soil, for our trees and plants that are adapted to clay soils, they can actually pull a lot of nutrients out of it. And from that perspective, that means that we may not need to fertilize as often as we think because there's a lot of nutrients in clay soil. All right, misconception number one. Let's move on. All right, misconception number two is we get a lot of calls in plant clinic um, from people whose arborist companies or who feel like they really need to fertilize their trees every year. Um, and they call us and they say, well, when should I fertilize my tree? Should I fertilize it in the spring and in the fall? Um, should I do, when should I do it? Um, and, you know, as with all good horticulture questions, the answer is, well, it depends. So the facts are that it depends on the age of your tree and the type of soil that you have. So we've just finished talking about how fertile clay soil can be. So in clay soil, some trees may never need to be fertilized. Now, if you live in an area where the soil is very poor or very sandy, where it doesn't hold a lot of nutrients, you may need to consider fertilizing more often. Um, but when we're talking about age of the tree, young trees um, tend to put on a lot of new growth quickly. And often they can use an extra boost with some fertilizer. Um, most fertilizers have a lot of nitrogen and what that does is encourage a lot of new leaf growth. Current science actually recommends that we don't fertilize new trees in the first year. And the reason for that is we don't want them putting on a lot of new leaves. We really want them to be reestablishing their root system during that first, second year um, and getting that root growth going rather than to force canopy growth. So, you know, for young trees, you're looking at fertilizing once a year at most, usually after the first year or two years after planting. 
Um, and then that can help with that quick growth um, where the, the trees could use an extra boost. So now mature trees um, often don't need to be fertilized um, regularly. Um, for mature trees, even in sandy soils, you may only need to be fertilizing every three to five years. Um, now, there are some caveats to that, of course. If you're seeing pale green or undersized leaves, if your tree has a failure to thrive, if you're seeing leaves that are yellow with green veins in them, um, those things might require some additional fertilization, but you want to know what the issue is. So for instance, in high pH soils, some trees like birches, red maples, pin oaks, they have trouble accessing the nutrients in the soil when the pH is too high. So you may need to try and amend the pH or you may just need to provide specific nutrients for those trees um, that are accessible to the tree roots rather than them having to try and pull them out of a high pH soil. Um, so there's no formula about fertilizing. Um, we don't really need to fertilize every year once a tree reaches some sort of maturity after eight or 10 years. Um, and for very mature trees, you know, there's not a lot that's required unless you're seeing issues with those trees. All right, moving on to our next misconception. The next misconception is that my tree is having an issue. Fertilizer is going to help it or is going to resolve that issue. Um, I know you guys are, are well versed in, in horticulture um, because you're part of the Conservation Foundation. Um, but we get a lot of calls about people who say, there's something wrong with my tree. What can I fertilize it with that will bring it back to health? And I kind of want to dispel that um, because fertilizer is like a vitamin pill. Um, you know, it can give a boost to healthy trees. But just like you wouldn't have a steak dinner to fix a broken leg or take a vitamin pill to fix a broken leg or cure your pneumonia, you can't cure a tree disease or fix a lightning strike or solve a root problem with additional nutrients. Um, so if your tree is struggling, let's observe and let's determine the problem. Hmm, there's a free resource called the Plant Clinic that you can contact. Um, and then resolve that problem if possible. And then once that problem is resolved, you know, then you can think about maybe fertilizing to help support that tree a little bit more. Um, and as always, you know, too much of anything can be a bad thing. So inorganic fertilizers are actually salts and those can burn tree roots or plant tissues if they're over applied. Um, my grandfather, as lovely as he was, always thought that if, well, if a little is good, then a lot is really good. In fertilizer, that can be a real problem. And you want to be very careful if you are applying fertilizer um, to really think about, um, really read the package label and apply according to the, the dosages recommended. All right. Misconception number four, let's talk about watering. Um, when people put new trees in, um, the first thing they think that they need to do is like turf or something else, they think they need to water it two or three times a day um, or even every day. And most people do water, um, but we don't do it efficiently and we don't do it well. Um, so they're looking for a formula for a new tree, and that's not necessarily the best thing to do. Um, so the facts are that newly planted trees do have a limited root system. So we do need to be sure that water is available to that root ball because the roots haven't spread beyond that. And so that it can't access any of the moisture that's outside of that root ball. Uh, so even if it's been pouring rain, if that root ball is underneath the tree canopy, which has been sloughing that rain off, um, it may not be getting the moisture that it needs. 
So while we don't recommend watering daily necessarily, we do recommend checking the soil at the root ball daily. Um, what that does is that helps us understand if and when the soil is starting to dry out. So every site is gonna be different. There's no formula. It's gonna be due to soil type. It's gonna be due to weather. It's gonna be due to the, the hydrology of the, of the area that it's in. So we need to check that soil regularly, but we don't necessarily need to water every time we check. We only need to water when the soil is starting to dry out. The second thing we need to think about is that we really want to water thoroughly so that water penetrates down into that root ball all the way to the bottom. So, um, and I have a neighbor, bless his heart, who does this. Um, he goes out and he waters his trees for about five minutes with the hose every day. You wanna avoid this kind of light shallow sprinkling. Um, and the reason that you wanna avoid that is because what it does is it causes the root system to only grow in the top quarter inch of soil or wherever that water has been able to penetrate. Um, you really want those, that root system to sink into the soil 16 or 18 inches. Um, that's where most of the moisture um, access is for trees. So you're gonna avoid that light shallow sprinkling. Um, with a new tree, an easy way to do this is with an irrigation bag and that's shown here in this picture. Um, this bag delivers water straight down to the root ball. None is lost. We know exactly how much we've put on. Um, the thing that we need to make sure that we understand is that the bag is going to be empty sometimes. It doesn't need to stay full. The whole point of this bag is to distribute their pinpoint holes in the bottom of this thing. And the idea is that it's going to distribute water evenly over the entire root ball. So if you've got one of these bags, and they're 25 or 30 bucks on, you know, on, on websites, um, but don't fill the bag every day. You're going to consider filling the bag every four to seven days, and you're still going to be testing that soil underneath the bag. So when that starts to dry out, that's when you're refilling the bag. All right. So don't need to water new trees every single day. Um, here's another very common watering misconception and one that um, we work really hard to dispel. Um, and that's that mature trees don't need to be watered because their roots are very deep. So here's the reality of most tree root systems. Um, they are in the top two feet of soil. There will be a few roots that go down further into the soil that are stabilizing the soil and may take up some water. But most of the water accessing capacity of a tree is in the top two feet of soil. Um, so again, this picture illustrates how the average tree root system spreads out as long as there's not impediments. Um, big trees, older trees can be really difficult and time consuming to water. But in dry weather, you're still going to want to try and water trees at least every 10 to 14 days. Um, when that soil starts to really dry out because it hasn't rained, um, a good deep soaking at the drip line, not at the trunk, is going to provide a lot of benefits. It's going to remove stressors from this tree. It's going to support all of the processes that need chemical processes that need to happen in the trees, photosynthesis, all the water movement up and down. Um, trees need moisture to do that, even big old trees. So you want to uh, make sure to water your older trees. They're not completely drought tolerant. Some are more able to take it than others. Um, you know, I said every 10 to 14 days, if you have a mature birch and you're, it's not raining, you don't want those to dry out at all. You almost can't water those enough. Um, and I know a lot of us have those. So um, mature trees do need to be watered. And let me show you sort of um, an example of a root system um, here at the Arboretum, we took a tree out of the soil. We literally dug it out, roots and all, um, so that we can see that the root system grows more wide than deep. And of course, we do a lot of experimenting on these kinds of things. We actually have a root biologist. Um, but this kind of gives you an idea of how the roots spread um, rather than, you know, deep down. Nothing could be further than the truth than that, that image that we all have of the tree upside down in the soil. Um, 
So that gives you a picture. All right, let's go on. Um, I see mulch piled up around the base of trees all the time. That must be right, right? Um, growers, installers, designers, city foresters, we're all having a lot of discussions about how this mulching process, we call it volcano mulching, how this process got started. Um, some people think it's that, you know, we edge and we throw dirt against the, the tree and cover it with mulch. Some people feel their contractors just have too much mulch and they're going to put it around the trees. In any event, this really seems to have become a common practice. And we really want to discourage that. Um, the facts are, you know, we use mulch for a large variety of reasons to conserve water, to moderate soil temperature, protect the trunk from uh, equipment damage, minimize weeds. There's a lot of really good things that mulch does. But the reality is for any of that stuff to happen, the mulch actually has to be in contact with the soil. And when you've got it piled up around the trunk, there's a very small area that's actually in touch with the soil. Um, so that's one issue. The second thing is that um, wet mulch or mulch holds moisture by definition. If it's piled against the trunk of a tree, against the bark, it can actually rot the bark off. And what's right under the bark? It's that cambium layer that moves water and nutrients up and down the tree. And if we rot that bark off all the way around, we've destroyed that layer and we've killed the tree. So you wanna be really careful about piling um, mulch against the trunk. Um, and here's an example. Here's a proper way. It should look more like a donut than a volcano. Um, and then here's a little bit more information. Um, for most trees and shrubs, three to four inches um, is about the maximum depth for mulch. You'd like to have it spread evenly over as much of the root system as feasible. Um, big old trees can have 100 feet of root system um, radiating out from them, and that's not always feasible to mulch the whole thing. But if you can mulch as much of it as possible, um, that's great. Um, and what should be happening is that you should be keeping three to four inches, um, the mulch three to four inches away from the base of the plant. You want to be able to see bare soil right at the base of the plant. You're not losing any of that moisture retention or any of the fine things that mulch does, but you are protecting the tree. Another thing I wanted to mention here is we talk about the root flare. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with that, the root flare is where, um, let's see if I can get my cursor to show. Um, the root flare is right where the trunk widens out into the root system, so right here. And that's really an important area to be able to see above the soil. Um, you want to be able to see that because above that is where the bark starts. Um, and below that is the root system, which is used to being under the soil. So um, you're looking for that root flare. You're looking for it to be visible above both the soil and the mulch. All right, moving on. Um, so it used to be that when we planted a tree, especially around here, because everybody thinks their soil is really terrible, um, is that we would add a lot of organic matter to the planting hole because we felt like if we could make that planting hole really a nice loose place for the roots to grow, um, that would help the tree. So while this practice was once considered correct, the science has actually shown that this does not work, especially in our heavy clay soils. And the reason is, is because the tree roots will grow out in that lovely soft soil in the hole. And then it's gonna to come to the edge of the hole where there's hard pan clay um, and it's gonna to start to circle. And I think you, we've all seen this in parkway trees where the roots are like circled completely around the trunk of the tree. It's because these are hard, hard areas, these boulevards, and they've dug a hole, they've stuck a tree in, they've put some really nice soil in with it, and then they've mulched over it and they've just left it. And there's no way for those roots to grow into that soil. Um, so what do we wanna do? 
We want to backfill with the soil we dug out of the hole. Um, and the other thing we want to do is um, make sure that um, there are some, there's some way for it to get outside the clay bowl if you've got really hard pan clay. That may mean scoring. Um, that may mean digging, it does mean digging a wider hole. Um, so a good planting hole is gonna be the same depth of the root ball in the center. It should have sloping sides so that it's saucer shaped overall. And it really should be two to three times the diameter of the root ball. The other thing about this is that it should have a bottom that's kind of undisturbed. You don't wanna be piling loose soil back in because what that does is then as the tree settles, you lose that root flare um, and these trees end up being planted too deeply and that can impact the long-term health of the tree as well. All right, let's keep going. Every tree needs to be pruned yearly. Um, this is another misconception that we see quite a bit. Um, the reality is that for mature trees, you know, most of the time, a five to nine year cycle should be plenty to take any corrective action. Um, you want to be planting your trees so that the, the mature size fits where you've planted it. So you shouldn't need to be pruning annually to control the size of the tree. Um, so for mature trees, you're only going to prune as needed to correct problems. For younger trees, you do want to prune maybe every year, every other year for the first, you know, two to six years. And the reason for that is you want to produce a strong structure. And let me show you what that means. Um, for young trees, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be, you know, removing competing leaders. You're going to be removing crowded branches or malformed branches, water sprouts, um, branches that cross and rub. If you can see a girdling root on a young tree, you have a good opportunity to remove it so that it doesn't strangle the tree down the road. Um, you have a chance to remove low branches. All of this kind of pruning should be done when a tree is fairly young um, so that you have good structure as the tree ages. Um, so those are some things that you can do and that you may wanna do over time. Um, we also get asked a lot of times for formula, well, how much of the tree can I remove at once? There's no formula. Don't forget that the tree needs leaves to produce food for itself, to produce carbohydrates for itself, um, to have that chemical photosynthesis process. Um, and so if you remove a lot of um, a tree's branches at once, you could impact its growth. Um, for more mature trees, um, you really want to, if you're taking big branches off, um, we recommend that you use a three cut process so as not to rip that bark below the branch that you're pruning. And I think the key when you're pruning mature trees is you really can prune a bit for shape, but you're really, again, you're pruning for um, corrections, branches that are too low, broken branches, branches that are crossing. The key here is to be careful. If you have to be on a ladder with a saw, please call a professional. If your trees are near power lines, um, unstable, any of that sort of thing, call a certified arborist. You can contact the ISA, the International Society of Arboriculture. Most states have their own chapter of that. To find one in your area, no matter where you are in the world, ISA will have a name for you. Um, be very careful when you're pruning mature trees. Branches are heavy. Um, and you can injure yourself and others pretty easily. Um, these branches can weigh 500, 750 pounds. Um, and you do want to be careful with that. All right. Moving on. Um, so in Plant Clinic, um, in our 19,000 questions a year, a lot of them we get calls about is, um, I have ants in my tree and they're killing it. Um, seeing ants running around or on a tree can be really disturbing because you think that they're damaging them. But the truth is, is they're not really the real problem. They're not the underlying problem. 
Carpenter ants are looking for soft rotting wood in which to make their nests. So the presence of ants tells us to look for rotting wood somewhere in our tree. The rot may just be in a branch that can be easily removed, but it could also be at the interior of the trunk. And that's a more serious problem because that possibly compromises the structural stability of the tree. Um, so ants don't attack sound trees. Um, the real problem is the rotten wood. Um, if you're seeing a lot of ants on the interior of a tree, you're gonna wanna get the tree evaluated for structural soundness, especially if it could fall in a house, if it could fall in the street, something like that. Um, although we don't mention it in this misconception, um, borers are kind of the same way. Um, wood borers, the majority of wood boring insects only come to trees that are stressed or already in decline. So the reality is, is that if you can keep trees in good health, water them regularly, make sure that the trunks go, don't get damaged, um, that's gonna minimize these problems, ants and, ants and uh, borer problems. All right, so um, in a former life, I was a landscape designer and uh, my clients would often come to me after I had specked out a tree and say, I want the biggest tree we can find. I want a 40 foot tree that they have to bring in with a crane um, because I'm older and I want, I want a mature tree. Um, that's fine if you're looking for instant gratification and quite frankly, if you have a lot of money to spend. Um, but science has actually proven um, that smaller trees tend to establish faster after planting. Trees have to replace their root systems um, that they lost when they were transplanted before they can begin to grow again. Smaller trees actually lose less of their root systems when they're dug up. Um, so they have less to replace and they reestablish more quickly. Um, so in studies that have been done, a tree between one and a half to two and a half inches in trunk diameter at eye level will catch up with a tree with a six foot trunk diameter in two to three years. Um, because they reestablish faster, they start growing faster. Sometimes it can take three to five years for a six inch trunk diameter, as much as six or seven years for the root system to reestablish and for that tree to start growing again. So there's no reason not to put a larger tree in if you choose to do that, but recognize that a younger tree is probably gonna be a little bit healthier. It's also going to um, establish faster um, and you may not be gaining that much tree size um, over several years. They also require more care. I did want to mention that larger trees can offer great instant gratification, but they are going to require more than more than a couple of years of, of specialty care. All right. Um, another misconception we have, we have people who call us and say, I need to cut the roots of this tree. Um, they're, they're coming up above the soil, or I need to put a patio in and cut the roots. That won't hurt my tree, will it? just cutting a couple of roots. Um, the reality, oops, sorry about that, went too far. Um, the reality is it may be necessary in some situations. You may have to replace a sidewalk or you may have to replace a driveway, but no matter what, anytime you cut a root, there's always some impact on the tree. Um, trees grow a full root system in order to be able to support themselves both in terms of stability and in water um, and, and nutrient uptake. And so while it sometimes is necessary to cut a root, there will be impact. Um, you're gonna reduce water uptake. You may open the roots to disease and insect attack. Um, if enough roots are cut on one side of the tree, you may actually disturb the stability of the tree in a windstorm. They may be more prone to wind throw. Mm -hmm. um, and the issue is, is you know, they call us and say, well, if I only cut this much, will, I, will my tree die? And Flint Clinic, nobody else can predict what the impact will be, but just recognize that there will be some impact on the health of the tree. So if you're going to cut roots, cut as few roots as possible, use clean tools. I wouldn't fertilize during the year that you're cutting those roots. 
um, and make sure that your tree is regularly watered so that it has a chance to reestablish that root system that it lost. All right, so that's the bulk of my presentation. Um, I just wanted to give you my contact information because I said I would do that. Um, you can reach the plant clinic by phone at this phone number. Um, we are open from 10 to 4, Monday through Friday. Our phone lines are open. Somebody will answer the phone. You can email us at any time. Um, we, again, we do take uh, two business days or so to get back to you, but we will get back to you. Um, and then you can also visit all of our pages on our website. Um, the other thing you can do is you can check out some of our online classes. We have basic tree identification. We've got a lot of tree care classes through our adult ed program. And there's the, the website to do that. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we can take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Julie. That's really interesting. I was taking notes <laughs> over here. I'm always, I love doing these because I learn so much. Even when you think you know some things, <laughs> there's always more to learn. Um, we do have some really good questions that came up in the Q&A, so I'm going to go to those. Um, first, going back a little bit to when we were talking about fertilizing, mm -hmm. Amy asked, if we don't have a tree service and we're fertilizing on our own, what resources do you recommend for knowing how much and what type of fertilizer to use? How do we learn more about how to do that correctly? Yeah, so um, I can't stress enough to read the labels on things. Um, if you go buy a tree fertilizer, a fertilizer for trees and shrubs, one, you're looking for something that's slow release. Um, you're looking for something that you can spread over the entire root system. So something that's pelletized or liquid, um, rather than um, the spikes are really popular and they can do some help. But when you think about it, if you're putting that spike in one, even if you put 10 or 12 in around a large tree, you're fertilizing a really small section of the root system. Um, so you're looking to be able to spread that fertilizer overall. You want to be able to read the, the package directions and they'll give you some ideas. The other thing you can do if, if you're really concerned is you can actually get a soil test. Um, there are private labs, there are public labs, University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, Extension will, will do a soil test for you. Um, if you belong to the, your county farm bureau, most of them will do soil tests for you. Um, and they will actually tell you exactly what nutrients your soil needs. Um, always pay for the explanation. <laughs> um, it's usually a few dollars more, but it's always worth it. Um, and um, it will give you um, a pounds per square foot or pounds per thousand square feet of what you need to add to your soil. And that's a good way to learn too if you're really not sure what you should be doing. I think that's such valuable advice because a lot of times we just think, well, it must be lacking. And so we'll just dump something on there, but we don't really know. And maybe we're, maybe it is lacking something, but we're not giving it exactly what it is lacking. And we might be adding a bunch of nitrogen when it needs something else like phosphorus or something, you know, so it's, it's good to know what you're working with. Exactly. Yeah. And it may be that your soil has plenty of nutrients, but your tree just can't access it because it has a lack of water or it has a root problem or something. Like, like you mentioned the pH levels too sometimes. So yeah, great advice. Thank you. Um, so we have another one asking if you can explain what the water sprout is. So when we're talking about pruning, like what is a water sprout? How do we know which branches or what to look for? Yeah, generally a water sprout, um, and there's lots of terms for that. That's just one of the common names for these things. You get um, suckers from the root system. Water sprouts tend to be branches that stick up straight out of other branches. So they are not part of the normal structure of the tree. Um, one of the good ways to identify water sprouts right now is if you've got any ash trees that are infected with ash borer, you will see that the major branches all have a ton of branches sticking up and those are water sprouts. Um, so if you're seeing that on a young tree, it may be that that branch is a little bit damaged or it may just be sort of a fluke of nature. You do wanna remove those just so that the structure of the tree stays sound. Okay. Um, yeah, that's great. I feel like I see those a lot of times on fruit trees. I see a lot of, you know, on fruit well, trees, people are probably are different. Fruit trees mm -hmm. are different and you want to prune them differently. So if you have fruit trees and you're looking for production, you need to prune them completely differently than what I told you today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's um, they're easy to recognize, though, because they tend to especially, you know, things like pear trees when they grow vertically anyway. And then, you know, or apple trees, you'll see the branches going outward, but then a whole bunch that go straight up. So that's just people might have seen that and that might be something to compare it to that they 
would recognize. Um, so they know what to look for on their trees at home. Um, so we have a question from Mary. She wanted to know if there is a copy of the tree diagram you showed when you were talking about the pruning, showing where to make the cuts, if there's a copy of that image on the website. Um, so there is, we have a digital assets management program called ACORN, which you can access from our website. It's acorn.mortonarb.org. And if you put tree pruning in the search box and click on digitized images and hunt down through it, you will be able to find that image. Um, I'm actually putting that in the chat right now. So you said acorn.mortonarb.org. The uh, other thing is, if you really want it, email Plant Clinic and I'll send it to you. It might be easier than trying to hunt it down on our website. Perfect, thank you. Okay, and then we have a question about mulching. Mm -hmm. It says, I understand that sawdust as mulch can burn plants, but I've recently read that fresh wood chips from a residential tree trimming service is okay to use. Is that correct? So wood chips to break down require a lot of nitrogen. And there is some concern and the, the issue with sawdust is there's a lot of surface area where that nitrogen is breaking down, right? Um, and so it can use a lot of the nitrogen in the soil if you're using it as mulch. Wood chips don't have quite as much surface area. Um, you might like them to be a little bit aged, um, but it's, it's not gonna be as much of a drain on the nutrient, on the soil nutrients as sawdust would be. Um, people use wood chips all the time. They're fine. Um, there's usually plenty of nitrogen in the soil. It's very rare. If you get a soil test back and you don't have enough, enough nitrogen, that's weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, you know, wood chips are fine. Sawdust just creates a problem because of how fast it breaks down and how much nitrogen it uses. Okay, thank you. Um, then we've got so, okay, we've got, Amy said, last summer I had to cut roots on my hawthorn to put in a foundation within the drip line. The tree is clearly stressed this year as I can see black knot fungus coming on some of the branches this spring. Is mm -hmm. there anything I can do to help it out? Um, well, the first thing is, is on a, <laughs> if you can get one, um, once the weather dries out, you're gonna wanna prune as much of that black knot out as possible. I mean, you've got two different issues, right? You've got a root, root system that's been damaged and you've got black knot. Black knot is a fungal disease. It's not caused by the damaged root system. Um, stressed plants get diseases more easily. And so that's probably what the issue has been. So you're gonna have to deal with those two issues separately. Um, the, um, the root system issue, refrain from fertilization, make sure this tree gets enough water um, try and prevent any other damage to the tree. If you've already got black knot, I mean, those are usually on, those aren't usually on, on hawthorns, which black knot isn't a, isn't a disease of hawthorns. So maybe send us a picture and we'll figure out what you really have. Um, we'd be happy to help you with that. Mm -hmm. um, but you need to deal with the disease and the root system destruction separately. And the root system destruction, what you're really doing is you're trying to encourage new root growth. So water, um, if it's really bad situation, uh, you can have a certified arborist come and put um, a growth regulator on your tree, which means that it won't put out, it won't put out a lot of new canopy for a couple of years. But again, that's going to allow the root system to, to redevelop. That's great. That's really interesting. And I love that too, just that, that backup to have the, the clinic there available to help, you know, e either verify or correct the diagnosis, <laughs> you know, that's really, that's a valuable resource. That's why we're here. We're happy to do it. That's fantastic. Um, we've got a few more questions. We've got a few more minutes. So as long as you're okay to keep going, I'll, I'll get to a couple more. Okay. We've got, um, um, we have a question that says, any tips on cutting and killing invasive trees, such as tree of heaven or groves of native sassafras that are invading close to the house? Um, so native sassafras, by definition, can't be invasive. It is a suckering tree, so you want to be using it carefully um, in, you know, in, in areas where you can stand to have it move around a little bit. Um, for any of these trees that, that sucker like this, whether they're invasive or not, 
most of the time it's not enough to just cut them because they just send up new shoots. So while we're not big proponents of using a chemical every time you turn around, um, a systemic herbicide painted on the trunks once you cut it is going to kill the root system. Um, buckthorn especially is a, is a problem. Honeysuckle is really tough. Um, and there's almost no way to dig up the root system on these plants um, unless you get them really young. So if you're trying to rid, especially large areas of this, if you cut and paint, you're using as little chemical as possible, but you're still getting the job done. Um, and there are a couple of, um, of products that are effective at that. And if you give us a call, we'll let you know what they are. Yeah, and thanks for um, clarifying too, because I know language, a lot of times we, we tend to call a lot of things invasive when I think really we mean vigorous or, you know, determined or aggressive or prolific or resilient, you know, there are all kinds of words and, you know, we know what we're talking, we know what, you know, what you mean, but there is, that is, that can be an important differentiation between, um, you know, actually invasive like DNR listed invasive species compared to just an aggressive grower, you know, so that's a good. Um, right. And if you're interested in, in more information on which species are identified in the Midwest, there's a, an organization called the Midwest Invasive Plant Network, and they have a fantastic plant list that lists all of the states in the Midwest and all of the plants that are on any legal documents, watch lists, noxious weed lists. Um, and so if you're interested in which ones actually are considered invasive, that would be a great place to go. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, we've got um, Karen says, I planted trees two weeks ago and I put compost in the holes um, as it is clay soil. Should I dig them out and get rid of the compost and put the clay back in? They're small and it would be easy to do since it just happened. You know, I didn't know, now I know. So yeah, what's your advice? What do I do now? <laughs> um, if it was just two weeks ago and you put more than say 25% compost in there, you may actually want to dig those out because that compost, just like sawdust, is gonna, it can burn tree roots as it's decomposing. Um, so if you put a lot of compost in there, you may wanna dig them out. If you only put 10 to 15% in, it's probably fine um, and you shouldn't have to dig anything out. Um, what you will wanna do though, is you'll wanna put some sort of um, compost or wood chips beyond the tree hole so that over time that organic matter can decompose and get into that soil so that your tree roots have got some sort of shot at getting outside that hole. Okay, fair enough. Good thing, yeah, this is good timing then <laughs> before it got too far into the season. So if it does need to be corrected, you still, you still can make adjustments and fix it now. So that's fantastic. Um, and then we also have a question, and this is this is a, a good question too. Um, these are all really great questions. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> these are great. Um, when is the best time of year to prune most of our trees? Like when should we, just as general, you know, good practices, when should we be trying to do this? Um, we recommend in the dormant season, um, if you can do it over the winter. Now there are, ex like everything in horticulture, there are a few exceptions to that. <laughs> Um, you know, if you've got a spring blooming tree and you want to protect the flower buds on it, you can prune after, um, after it blooms. Um, the other thing is if you've got a birch, um, a maple, um, there are a couple of trees that really bleed a lot if you prune them in late winter or early spring. It doesn't necessarily hurt the tree, um, but that sap flow can be really, it can be really disturbing to see this water flow of this waterfall of sap flowing out of your tree um, as the weather starts to warm up. Um, so we usually recommend that you wait until those trees have got leaves on them um, because by then the sap has, has sort of moderated and you're not gonna get all of, that, all of that bleeding going on. Okay, good to know. And that makes sense when we think about like the maple tree tapping and stuff and the, you know, that flow when that's happening. And in that case, if someone's trying to get the sap, then they want it flowing. But if you're pruning your trees, you don't want them, you know, just weeping <laughs> yeah. everywhere. It's, you know, that's not really going to hurt the trees um, as long as you've done it, you know, late winter or whatever. Uh, but it is very disconcerting. <laughs> Yeah, I'd be worried. I would be worried that I heard it, that I did something wrong. <laughs> so good. 
All right. Well, fantastic. We actually got all of the questions and it is just about eight o'clock. So we're good on our timing too. If we, I would say last call, if anybody has one last question, we might be able to take one more quick one if anybody has one, but we've got all of the ones um, answered from, from the Q&A. So I appreciate everyone posting them in there. And um, thank you so much, Julie. We've got, we've got thank yous coming in, but I don't see any new questions. So I think we're good. Thank you so much, Julie. This was very helpful. It was very informative. And um, I think, you know, hopefully we all learned something. I know I did so that I can apply this in my own yard. So yeah, this is very helpful. I appreciate this. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. Thanks so much, Connie. Of course. Thank you. Everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you for joining us. I will post this on YouTube and I'll put all the links on there too. Um, most of them are in chat, but uh, we'll follow up with everything with the, with the recording as well have all of that handy for you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful night, everyone. Good night, everybody.